the Sheridan. Lacey Capel stood before the crumbling gates of the Sheridan Manor, looking like an ant against the grandness of the house. She wrapped her coat tight around her body with her trembling and rigid hands. One of those very hands clutched the thin slip of paper that read a heartfelt goodbye from her dearest Anton, and the other inch towards the rusty gate doors. Just beyond the gate stood the manor, alone on the mora side from a train track. It stood deserted and high with peeling paint and windows shut from years of disuse, the tips of the manor covered by the thick fog. Not a single person ever set foot on the moor, let alone come close to the gates of the Sheridan Manor, not after the word of the deaths reached the townsfolk. Lacey slowly pushed the gate open, roughly taking in a breath as she heard its loud creak. She wiped the dust off on her coat and stepped inside the compound. Dead weeds sprouted from the ground, brushing against her legs and the naked trees stretched their gnarly branches out as if they were grabbing at the hazy air. Pair that with the dense fog and it was enough to make the billiest man tremble. Lacey looked around and sped up. It was cause of the eerie feel that she decided that she'd rather be inside. Yet, as she neared those damned decrepit peeling doors that were hanging off of two hinges, she began doubting whether this was something she wanted to do. It was all to prove whether she was brave enough since the lads in her town made a mockery of her. They'd said Anton liked his women fiercer, not fiercer than him but perhaps strong enough to hold off an intruder while Anton went and grabbed weapons. At this Lacey had said women weren't supposed to be strong and that everyone knew men were supposed to be the fearless protectors. They had responded, That's true. But Anton is different. And those very words were the reason Lacey stood, eyes wide and body shaking, creaking the doors of the Sheridan Manor open. She gently shut it, careful not to make the slightest noise, and turned back around, still gripping Anton's letter for her life. It was dark inside, but she decided against using her flashlight just yet. She was standing in the foyer, a space with only a lone red chair that leaned crooked against the wall. Something putrid filled the air and she wrinkled her nose, trying not to gag. She walked deeper into the manor, entering the kitchen that had counters with layers of dust as thick as her finger and scurrying mice, and then entering the living room. A wooden table rested in the middle of the room and two peeling love seats were placed against the bookshelves. Staring at the couches, she couldn't help thinking of Anton. He pleaded with her, got down on his knees with his hands clasped in front of his men. Lacey, with tears filling her eyes, had apologized and told him that she had a purpose to serve. They quarreled about it but Lacey had stood her ground even after being reminded that several women had died around the manor, but one specific woman and apparently most recent had fallen on the tracks just as a train was coming. Ethel Wallace. A light thud sounded from behind Lacey. She gasped and swiveled around. Nothing. She reached into her satchel and fumbled around inside until she found her flashlight. She quickly turned it on and shone it around the room again being met with only silence and the beetles running in between her legs, trying to crawl up them. She whispered a prayer and turned away from the love seat and towards the winding staircase. She was here to find a brush. They'd said if Lacey was really going that she needed to find a brush marked with a star and bring it back to them. A few of them said that when the manor was in pleasant shape, their forefathers inked the handle of a white brush with a star. They never mentioned the location, sending a skeptical Lacey off to a place with scarce information. She lifted the end of her dress with one hand as she slowly climbed the staircase and held the flashlight with the other. As she moved higher up, the chillier it got, her slender arms underneath her coat becoming prickled with goose flesh. She tried to keep her heavy breathing at bay and continued forward. The light shone on a few portraits of women lining the wall and a blank one that perhaps didn't get to be filled yet, light leading the way. Lacey's eyes widened as she stared at the women, an eerie feeling swimming around in her gut. It was only her fearful brain playing tricks on her. She hurried up the remaining steps.
A dim hallway was what she entered when she set foot on the second story. Rooms lined this corridor, and Lacey felt her feverishly beating heart drop down to her knees when she knew she'd have to open them and search for the brush. She inhaled and walked onward, lowering her flashlight. The windows ahead were boarded up but allowed a few small streams of light though outside was still foggy and gray. Lacey opened the first door, grimacing as it gave a loud creak. She picked up her flashlight again and shone it around the room. It was small and full of boxes. She scurried over to them and crouched down, back pressed against the wall so that she could see if anything crossed in front of the door. Not that it would happen. Say, was it even a sure thing that this place wasn't just old and broken? Were the stories about the Sheridan Manor not mere superstitions? Lacey scoured the boxes, glancing at the doorway for any sign of all things strange. And there were none. A bit discouraged at not coming across the brush, she lifted her dress and stood up, quietly walking out of her current room and entering the next one. It was a bedroom, and one not too shabby, Lacey noticed. A poster bed and two velvet couches sat there. Lacey went and settled down on one couch, her mind now focusing on her grumbling stomach. Nervously, she pulled out a loaf of bread she'd packed in her coat pocket and took a small bite, maintaining ladylike manners even in a place like this. Lacey's heart ached at the thought of Anton. He was a good man and their courtship was well approved of from both parties. She wondered how his parents would react knowing she went off in search for a brush to prove young men wrong and further impress their son. Lacey opened her eyes and thought she saw a figure pass in front of the doorway. She screamed and slapped her hand over her mouth. Standing up, she fingered the dagger Anton had slipped to her before her journey. She walked towards the door and looked around her. Her eyes only fell upon a quiet and empty hallway but now darker than when she'd arrived. Stepping back inside the room, she gently shut the door and locked it with a key that was hung on a wall nail. She tiptoed back to her spot on the couch. Hard thudding, she remembered why she'd even set foot on the moor. This was all for Anton. She was going to prove she was worthy enough for him. Perhaps he'd see he needn't wait any longer and propose. Tucking her barely tasted loaf back in her coat pocket, she peered outside. Night had fallen. The gloomy and dark outside was now pure black against her window so that she couldn't see if anything was out on the compound. Like Anton had told her, she shouldn't travel once it was nighttime. Come tomorrow early morning and the brush was not found, she was to journey back immediately. Although the lads knew Anton longer than she... Lacey was still sure in her heart that if she entered town with a brush marked with a star or without, Anton would still be enamored of her and t'was this peaceful thought that prompted Lacey to get up and prepare the bed for the night. She placed the key on the desk and pulled back the covers and slipped inside, hand clutching the dagger. Now, despite all horrors and thoughts of them, incredibly, she was able to drift off into a stirring slumber and then a deep one and this would have continued had it not been for that small noise that stood out in the dreadful silence. A click. Lacey's eyes widened and she dared not move an inch. Under the covers, she enclosed her hand around the dagger in her satchel and surveyed the possible cause with only her eyes. Eyes adjusted and looking around, nothing seemed out of place and she almost missed it as the room was too dark, but then she didn't the door. It was open. Lacey's heart hammered inside her chest, and she murmured silent prayers as she slipped out the dagger and quietly stepped out of the bed. She glanced at the desk where she placed the key and it was still there. Fierce was but a word if the one who exhibited it was no more. Anton would understand. She pressed against the door jam and slid out of the bedroom, as quiet as could be, and shone her flashlight in the hallway. She was met with nothing. She pursed her lips and crept forward, wondering if she had gone mad. Wouldn't one think they, too, had gone mad if they were in Lacey's shoes? Was it not one's mind playing tricks on them? Lacey's forehead broke out in a cold sweat.
She would have to disobey Anton and travel by night. She turned around and gasped. In front of her stood a shadow. Its mouth was gaping and took half of its face, and in the place where eyes sat were black sunken holes. It reared its head back with insane speed and lowered it again, the eyeless holes now filled with demonic ones. Lacey fell to her knees, screaming, and rushed to the staircase on her fours. She dared not look back at that thing. Not paying any mind to injury, she threw herself down the staircase, landing with a thud. She didn't halt once before dashing to the doors of the manor but didn't get to open it before she felt an icy scaly hand grab her ankle. Lacey shrieked and clawed at the ground, her eyes shut tight, not wanting to turn around. It sank its nails into her flesh. Lacey screamed with tears pouring out of her eyes. The whistles of the train sounded as it passed them and left down the moor. When the last faint whistle was blown, the creature convulsed. Lacey's raw throat gave its last shriek as it lunged for her. And it just so happened that when Lacey was no more, the empty portrait on the staircase had a new face on it. The End Caroline. This is the place where nightmares dwell, where darkness reigns and terror fell. In every part where dead things skulk, deathly quiet, amassed in bulk, they await the stranger from the skies, hiding in the dark with an awful surprise. Come one, come all, and do not fuss. Come see the man whose soul belongs to us, and all around lie deserted homes. Where the wind does not whistle, but moans. This is where those who have died an unspeakable death are doomed to forever wander in endless misery. Every nook and cranny of this place stank of horror. In every corner, Sean could see blood, could hear screams, could smell death. He could feel the terror that clung to the walls like a creature of the deep sea wrapping its tentacles around its petrified victim as it drags it to the depths. He vomited again. First time in a few weeks. He wondered if it was the memory of this place, or the sickness that came with it. Or perhaps it was his own guilt, knowing that he had a major part to play in what had happened here. He was in somebody's house. The person, or people who lived here did not know Sean, and he had never known them. But he knew important details about them, enough to know that he never wanted to meet them. He had feared deep inside that eventually there would come a time where he must encounter them. It had been one of the many, endless fears that kept him awake at night. It hadn't taken long. On his third night here, the lady in red came to visit him. Or rather, he had visited her. He had been the one that had invaded her house, after all. He had been lying on top of a dirty mattress watching the snow fall gently and soundlessly to the streets outside when he heard her footsteps. He was frozen to the bed in terror. His body went rigid and it took a moment for him to even be able to turn his head towards the door of the bedroom he was in. By the sound of the footsteps, he judged that whatever was coming was currently on the staircase. The old wood of the steps bent and creaked with each ghostly step. He held his breath. Outside the door, the footsteps stopped and were replaced by a slow scratching sound. The handle moved slightly and shakily as the thing behind the door fumbled with it, most likely trying to grasp on properly to push open. And then he heard what could only be described as a manic sort of moan. Eiahua! Eiahua! Sean tensed his body. His eyes were wide circles beneath his sweating forehead. And then the door opened. And there she stood. The lady in red. Only, she wasn't wearing anything red. Sean couldn't tell if she was really wearing anything at all. The red was unmistakably blood, appearing to pour all the way down the woman's body and soak the floor beneath her. Sean screamed at the sight of her. <laughs> 
she screamed back. Hers was a scream of haunting sadness mixed with unabated fury. It was enough to make Sean feel like throwing up. She stumbled into the room and began making awkward, jagged movements as she did so. She looked as though she was searching for something as her hands began patting the walls, leaving bloodied marks everywhere. She frantically searched the far wall and then stumbled, fell to the floor and crawled to another, all the while maintaining that desperate scramble. And then she turned and faced Sean. Her face was scarred and burned. Several white blisters covered her dark, twisted face. Her eyes were fire, looking at Sean with a fury so deep it would have unsettled the most evil and unspeakable of demons. His body finally allowed him to move when the lady sprung towards him. He shot up off of the mattress and flung himself out of the window, falling from the second floor and crashing into the thin layer of snow beneath. He pushed himself to his feet and sprinted down the empty streets without looking back, frantically patting away the snow on his body. In the distance, the lady screamed. He hadn't slept that night. He roamed the abandoned streets trying to take some form of comfort in the gentle snowfall but he could find none. He wondered for a moment why he didn't just allow himself to leave this place. Because I shouldn't, was his answer. If I leave I shall be doomed to live a worse nightmare than even the one found here. He decided to spend each night in a different house. The change of scenery settled him somewhat, and he imagined it reduced his likelihood of another run-in with the Red Lady. He could picture her stumbling and dragging herself around each house, carefully checking every room for him. What exactly would she do with him when she caught him? His mind turned to every dark possibility imaginable. It made his very soul shiver. The sickness had set in some two weeks later. He'd thrown up multiple times and twice he found blood mixed in with the rest of the foul things ejecting from his body. His skin began to itch. Lightly at first but eventually his arms, legs, neck and face were red and began to blister. By the third week there was a constant bleeding. He began to struggle to breathe, and when this eased off a little it was no longer difficult, but incredibly painful. A consistent agonizing cough began and some of these again were accompanied by blood. I've lost so much blood I should be dead already, Sean thought. By the fifth week, Sean's nightmares were becoming unbearable. One night, after he finally fell asleep following a fit of bloodied coughs, he dreamed he was awoken by screams. He stood up and ran outside his house. When he flung the front door open, the screams got louder but nobody was there. He called out to the ghostly, invisible people but nobody answered. He ran down the empty streets, and as he did the screams continued escalating in volume. They got so loud that he covered his ears with his hands in a failed attempt to cut the noise out, for it was louder still when his hands were at his ears. He took them away from his head and looking down at them, he saw that there were thousands of tiny, terrified faces on his hands screaming loudly. Suddenly the sky lit up in a huge beam of radiant brilliance. The light seemed to make Sean's scars burn badly, and it was too much for his eyes which he now tightly shut and placed an arm over her forehead to try to block out some of the pain. The little people on his hands howled louder than ever as Sean cried out the only word that was on his mind. The name that haunted his every waking moment. Caroline. Finally the light faded to darkness, but the faces continued to shout, and now Sean joined in on the wailing. Every single face was staring at him, wide-eyed and petrified. They seemed afraid of him. He pleaded with them to stop screaming, but they wouldn't. He felt as though it was driving him to madness. He felt he had to do something about it. He ran into the nearest house and found the kitchen. Inside one of the drawers he took out the sharpest knife he could find and placed his hand face down on the counter. The faces on his left hand began crying out and pleading. No. Please. Don't cut us off. You can't do this. Please. Sean ran the blade back and forth across the top of his left wrist, 
The pain was searing but he continued madly slicing into his skin while the red faces of the people on his hand continued moaning in horror. He eventually passed out. And when he awoke in the same house, with the same scarlet knife in his hand and no faces but a new, deep gaping wound in top of his wrist, he realized that it was no dream at all. After that, the sickness seemed to disappear. The vomiting stopped, his breathing was clearer, and the sight of blood had not been present for several days, save for the wound on his wrist. He'd wrapped his hand in toilet paper temporarily until he'd found some proper bandages two days later. He found nothing else to treat his wound with however, and it stung and throbbed painfully. He should have had enough bandages to keep replacing the old ones with for about a week, but the bleeding was so severe that they were soaked within minutes. Why am I even bothering to bandage it up? Sean found himself wondering. Why not just bleed out and end all of this? Because you need to see it all. You need to see Caroline's destruction. You need to understand fully the extent to which she ruined lives. Why? I've seen enough. No. You can linger here in this place for a thousand years and still you would not know the terror and utter desolation that she caused. You could never know it. And that's why they hate you. Sean knew that they hated him for more than the simple reason of being unable to understand or appreciate their pains. They hated him because of much more than that. Oh yes. If they could, they would drag him down with them into the very depths of their despair to show him, just for a moment, what the word pain really meant. They would tear his very being from him, crumple it up and throw it into the nothingness beyond what was waiting for them. And even then, he would know nothing of their everlasting anguish. He was eventually visited again. This time it was a pale specter of a being. He'd been unable to sleep and was staring out of the window at the falling snow. Oh, why was he still pretending to himself that it was snow, when he heard a noise coming from the bathroom? A slight bump followed by what sounded like soft weeping. Shivering. Sean got out of bed and walked quietly down the hall and stood outside the bathroom door. Undeniably, something was in there, and it was crying. The sobs were soft and delicate. They depicted a great, hopeless sadness. It sounded to Sean like the most fragile, melancholy music that one would hear and be compelled to switch off for fear of being dragged into the same depression that the music was born from. For a moment he was unafraid, and stuck in his own grief. So much so, that some tears of his own began to form in his eyes. He wanted to see this person. The bathroom door was open a mere fraction, just enough to let out a thin strip of light if there had been one on inside. He carefully placed the fingertips of his right hand on the door, and gently pushed. The door creaked loudly. It opened just far enough for Sean to see the figure at the other side of it spin round and face him, less than two feet away. Through the thin gap in the door frame he could see a terrified face. He didn't know whether it was male or female, old or young. It was as pale as the light shone from a full moon but where its eyes should have been there were two large, black holes. Its mouth was much larger than it should have been for the size of its head and it twisted into a shocked and scared expression. Like the lady in red, it screamed. But there was no anger in this scream, no fury. It was the terrified wail of someone that feared for their life. The last sounds of its life, no doubt. It pulled the bathroom door fully open and Sean jumped back. The thing moved swiftly out of the room crying and screaming, never taking its huge black eyes from Sean. It floated down the hallway and disappeared. Sean was frozen stiff, listening out for the specter and wondering where it might have gone. The hallway was too dark to see anything in much detail, and it was impossible to know which way it went. Deciding that the thing clearly didn't want anything to do with him, he walked slowly back to the bedroom. Upon opening the door he found it there, sitting on his bed. It shot its head up upon Sean entering the room and wailed once more in terror. 
Once more it flew past him and disappeared. Sean decided to try a different house for the night, remembering that the lady in red had not followed him, but it was no good. Each house Sean visited, the specter was there, screaming in terror on sight of him. He tried sleeping in one of the houses that the spirit had fled from but peculiarly, it kept coming back into his room, seeing him and fleeing in terror again. Its screams were the most unpleasant sound that Sean had ever heard. It would be a while, he thought, before he felt safe enough to sleep again. Ultimately, the sickness returned. The nausea, the bleeding, the difficulty breathing. But this time it was more severe. Sean felt as though his time was nearly up. He felt exhausted all the time. Everywhere he walked he left blotches of blood in the snow, below his feet. But finally, he found what it was he was looking for. It came in the form of a little girl. She stood around four feet tall. Her clothes were ragged, full of holes and tears of every shape and size, revealing dark, scarred skin, a mixture of black and deep scarlet. She had no hair, and a face so deformed that it was impossible to see anything that resembled human expression. A hideous set of dark, crooked teeth were revealed by lips that had somehow been pulled back or ripped away. One eye was missing and the other was swollen to the point where it seemed as though it might burst upon the slightest of touches. Her nose with nothing more than two deep slits in the middle of her head. It's you! Sean wailed. Caroline. She moved slowly towards him, every painful step coming awkwardly and painfully. Sean could almost feel the endless agony of every movement. She extended an arm out to him and only then did Sean notice that three of her fingers were missing. Minimal casualties of a much greater struggle. The hand limply fell onto Sean's cheek and the girl stood, crookedly staring into Sean's face. The two of them stood there for a moment, looking at each other. And then the girl spoke. You did this. It sounded almost like a question and Sean nodded bleakly because he could not work up the courage to speak any more. Caroline, the girl croaked. And finally, Sean broke. Tears streamed down his face, and he wailed in anguished despair, just like the pale specter as the girl stood, disfigured arms still holding on to his cheek. He wept for what seemed like a long time, and then the girl collapsed to the floor, limp. Sean picked her up and carefully cradled her in his arms. She was as light as a dark, ghostly shadow. He carried her out of the burned ruins of the house he was in, outside to be softly buried in the grayish-white falling from the stars above. As he walked out of the house and into the road outside of it, he continued to weep. Just ahead of what used to be the gate of the house, one of the girl's arms dropped and then snapped off like a twig, hitting the floor with a thud. Sean lowered the girl beside it, and then bent onto his knees wailed into the darkness. Caroline, it was me who dropped you. I am the bringer of your destruction. I confess. I confess. And as though in answer, the streets became swarmed with many dark creatures that had been hiding. The lady in red and the terrified pale specter were there among thousands of others, all of them looking to be in similar pain to anyone else. Scarred and blackened faces, missing limbs, faces so deformed that if Sean were to survive this, would haunt his every moment of life henceforth. As they moved in towards him they began whispering and moaning. Caroline. 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 And finally they reached him, and Sean let them take him. At first he did not know what word to use to describe what was happening to him. But around three seconds before his death he thought of the perfect word to describe it. Devoured. The end.
Are you still here, Olivia? I met her in the dilapidated house two kilometers away from our house. I usually passed by here every afternoon while riding my bicycle. It was ten past five in the afternoon. I felt the cold wind, my hair stood on end. Anyway, I was used to it and I didn't bother about that. I stared at the house for a long time. I was suddenly flabbergasted when my phone rang. Kate! Where are you? Hurry, go home now! I broke out into a cold seat. I immediately leave the place. I arrived home, but no one was there. Mom! 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 I went to my mom's room. She was not there. Until I found a note. Kate, your father rushed to the hospital. I shouldn't push the panic button. I decided to call my mom. Hello, mom, how is dad? It made my world stop. I couldn't utter even single word. I rushed into my room and got my bag. The door seemed to sympathize with my agony. I drove my bike as fast as I could, but it seemed that I couldn't leave the place. Until I passed by at the dilapidated house. I was perplexed and distraught. Without noticing I was sobbing. I couldn't help myself. Suddenly it was dark around and I felt the numbness of my body. When I opened my eyes, I saw a woman holding my hand tightly. She was really my resemblance the picture of myself. She asked, How are you feeling right now? It was really clear as mud. I looked at her with bewilderment. She was trying to read what I was thinking, but she couldn't figure out. I saw her gloomy eyes as if in great misery. Someone approached me. She seemed to be just my age. Can you hear me? Her voice was very calm. When I opened my eyes, I saw her deep eyes. Those enraged and petrified eyes made my heart pounded. I felt the same thing with her. She left and went to one of the rooms. Take a rest until you're fully recovered, she added. I couldn't sleep. After a while she brought me an ill-scented blanket. I couldn't explain it. One thing I'm sure it was the smell of rotting human's body. Anyway, I didn't care. I know I was in a safe place. She went back to the gloomy room and brought me a pillow with a written name, Olivia. The old and fusty pillow reminded me of something. She hugged me tightly. I am glad that you're fine now. She said, her eyes were full of astonishment and satisfaction. Are you hungry? She asked me with a grin on her face. I just nodded. I felt I didn't eat for a long time. She went downstairs to prepare my food. I looked everywhere. My stuffs were all the same. I glanced at my table beside my bed. I saw a portrait of a merry family. They showed genuine love for one another. All of a sudden, my dejected heart began to break into pieces and tears fell on my cheeks. I wiped it off immediately. I heard her gentle voice again, which relieved my anxiety. Here's your food, I hope you like it. I know, she would not forsake me ever, I felt it. I tried to close my eyes, but I didn't sleep a wink. I wished I could sleep like a log. I checked the time. It was quarter to twelve. The candle was about to melt. I looked everywhere the house looked abandoned for many years. The spider's web covered the ceiling. I had a deep thoughts for a while. How could she survive here? I suddenly heard a horrible whimpering sounds. It came from a dim room where she used to go. My heart skipped a beat. The defeating silence added terror in the gloomy place. I stood and walked toward the room where the sound came from. The sound got louder and louder. I heard her screaming, and she was moaning in pain. I wanted to head out, but I was nearly paralyzed with cold. As I ate she couldn't take her eyes off at me. Bon appetit! I just nodded without hesitation. I almost consumed my food. I saw her tears falling on her cheeks.
she was pinning her hope on a new chapter of her life. Even though my dearest one passed away, I still had one left. I looked at her with full of hope. I didn't move for a long time. Suddenly someone grabbed my hand it was very cold. Don't be bothered about what you've heard. Even I can, but I couldn't. It's midnight while you are still awake. I just looked at her bloodless face. She sat beside me and told me, I don't like to stay here with myself alone. I didn't get her point. Could you please stay with me? I couldn't utter words at first. Yes, I will. But only tonight I'm sure my mom is already worried about me. Her face suddenly changed. It made my heart beat so fast. I even heard it. She asked me to follow her. We went outside. She ran across the street. I tried to save her. The ten-wheeler truck almost ran over her sickly body. I was glad I saved her. Until darkness covered me, my heart seemed to give up. I couldn't imagine how I fought on the brink of death. I couldn't even see my dad for the last time, and I couldn't sympathize with my mother during the time of sadness. I was comatose for a few months. I thought that was the end of my journey. I was enjoying the fresh air that touched on my face while riding on my favorite bike. I went back to the dilapidated house. It was still the same as before, it was full of grief. I came to one of the dim rooms. I saw a blanket and a pillow, Olivia. That was the name written. There was a cat under the stained and foul bed. I tried to look, I suddenly backed away. I saw the skeleton of a woman who wore a white dress that I saw before. I was petrified and ran outside. I immediately called the policemen to investigate the crime. They brought the body to examine. The body was under investigation. What was really happened to you? I just sighed. I couldn't imagine her fate. Who did this to you? I wished you would hear to tell me who mercilessly killed you. At night I couldn't sleep. I was still thinking of her. I tried to turn the lights off to help me fell asleep. She visited me once again. I felt her presence and cold hand. I felt it. My heart skipped for a while. Are you still here, Olivia? The end.